Okay, hi everybody. My name is Gila Glassberg, registered dietitian and intuitive eating counselor. And today I have with me Faggy Pollock. Thanks for joining us, Faggy. Thank you for having me. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, um, no, where should I begin? <laughs> um, well, I live in Arkansas, <laughs> so we have a little bit of a time difference between us now. Um, Bar Hashem married for 19 years now. I'm blessed with seven children. Wow. My oldest is 18, and my youngest is a four month old. Oh, wow. And, oh, my uh, Thank you. And besides the Bar Hashem full time, you know, wife, mommy, and trying to create a beautiful home and life for my family and myself. I am also um, a certified ESP practitioner, and I'm actually ESP practitioner. And I specialize in working with women who are struggling with anything related to marital intimacy. So it could be anything from um, sexual trauma in their background, trying to uncover that and work through that in their marriage. Or it could be anything as simple as, you know, if they're Baruch Hashem, a few babies, a few births, and they just never feel like they're interested in being with their husband anymore. It could be women who just have so much frustration built up inside them because of misconceptions, or lack of understanding about intimacy. So that's pretty much like the range of women who come to me are women who are looking to enhance and reach a much more fulfilling intimate relationship with their husband. And like I said, I specialize in marital intimacy. So, of course, Obviously, all other parts of marriage are also going to come up and be on the table because everything is so interrelated. But what I specialize in is specifically um, dealing with with marital intimacy issues, sexual intimacy issues, and um, so that's one thing. And I'm also a college teacher. I teach college and help them you know, before the wedding to prepare them hopefully so that they don't need <laughs> the therapy sessions that women who unfortunately didn't get good hadrocha and not they're not not saying that anyone who gets good hadrocha doesn't need therapy. I think therapy is good for everyone at some point in their life. But there are so many issues that couples face today that had they gotten the adequate preparation, the adequate hadrocha before their wedding, then it's likely, there's no way to know for sure, but it's likely that they would have not ended up where they are today and possibly they would have been in a much, much better place if they would have been adequately prepared. So that's also part of my, my mission that I really feel very strongly about um, in helping college come to their wedding, understanding sexual intimacy from a much broader perspective, a much more positive, healthy, Torah-based, because Torah is so beautiful and healthy that it, there, there is nothing other than Torah. It's just the way of life. It is life itself. So when a Kala can understand that and understand the clarity and understand and come into her wedding, understanding things that maybe perhaps her friends who don't get the Shadrach are as lucky as getting. So I do believe that they'll set up their relationship totally different. So that's another part of what I do. I, I do with Kala, and it's just, it's just a beautiful thing because we've been busy all day with, with Kala getting married, and it's very, very exciting to be part of that journey, you know, again and again with them. Um, and then I also have an online course which I which I offer, which also has, you know, it, it was born in this in this office. It was born in but seeing the need of so many women looking for help and 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 women who didn't get the training that perhaps they were deserving of and should have gotten before their wedding, and now are struggling and have a lot of question marks with not so many answers and nowhere to turn. So that's how my online course came to be um, in helping women really understand what's going on in a deeper level and really enhance their intimate relationship with their husband on all levels, or maybe both levels and more later. So that's um, the third part of what I do. So EFC practitioner, power teacher, and the creator of uh, a course in intimacy. Wow, you're you're a busy lady. <laughs> um, it sounds very busy. I mean, yeah, I, I, I work. I think I don't, you know, I think everyone works hard. Um, I do try to, you know, keep a sense of structure during my week and just, uh, you know, stay focused on them. Like I said, first the wife, then I'm on me. I'm a personal person for my, you know, myself. <laughs> Take care of me. Then a wife, and then a mommy, and then bar for shut everything else I do. So I do try to keep, you know. Work, you know, only in the morning. I try to figure it out in a way that it doesn't take over my life. Right. So, how did um, how did you come to specialize in marital intimacy? So it's very interesting. It's I remember once hearing the someone use the term like, "Oh, I didn't choose the topic. The topic chose me." You know, mm -hmm. I, I definitely feel that that's what happened over here, and through my own struggles. Um, entering marriage not adequately prepared, like so many women of my generation and before. 
and really, really struggling in certain areas and really feeling very alone and not having a little turn and then having a tremendous, tremendous Yata Dishmaya through, you know, different Hashkaha parts of stories of really, be, I call it being shown the light, like really, like I feel like Hashem just opened up the heavens and showed me the light. And once I was able to learn all those things that I was missing and I had the answers that I was looking for, I, I said to myself, there's no way that I could keep this to myself. Like this is something that had to be shared. Like why isn't everyone taught this? Like this is, this is so basic. So, so why are people not taught, taught that? What's your, like, what's your opinion on it? So, you know, it, it's hard to know, but from, from what I see, um, I would say I think it's a combination of a few things. I think it's, well, first of all, I would say first and foremost, it's definitely Gullus. Just being mm-hmm. in, Gull- in Gullus for so many years and being so influenced by the, by the nations around us and, the, and the, the, those that, you know, that took cholesterol into Gullus over the years. And, and I would say to a large extent, I think Christianity influenced specifically this topic, and that's also something that we could go into a little bit more further down the, you know, down the podcast if there's time, but I think that the breakdown in the Mesora, and because this is something that in Kuala Yisrael was always given over very privately, and that's the way it should be, it should be given over in, a, in an ideal world, and that's my prayer, that in a generation or two or less, hopefully our own daughters and their daughters, it will go back to be like it was, that every mother taught her daughter, every father taught his son, Rebbe taught their Talmudim, but that was it, and there was no need for anything else, because this is the, the, the heart and center of Kali Yisrael, and this is something that should be given over from mother to daughter. That's the way it should be. The fact that it isn't, that's not normal. Like, we think that this is normal. What we're living isn't normal. Normal is that a mother could give these things over to her daughter, and that these things are on the Torah from parents to children, and I, I, I firmly believe, I mean, it's, it's clear from, from things that I've learned and, and, and Gemaras that are often quoted when taught this topic, that that's the way it was, that even, you know, that even Amorayim would speak to their daughters. So, so it, something shifted once we went into Golos. And because it's so private and because it was a breakdown and because, you know, we can even look at history not so far back, you know, the, the Holocaust, um, the Haskala that, that came before that, there was a, a breakdown in the Masora in the sense that women were, there was like, I think there's always a generation gap, you know, between parents and children, obviously, because, you know, we, the, the generations continue on. But Haskell, I think it was very, very, it was very extreme. And really, daughters weren't able to accept from their mothers and weren't able to travel from them. It could be that at that point, the way mothers did not have enough to give over themselves. I don't know. I didn't study history well enough. But that, and then the Holocaust, and then we had a generation of these Gomos who had no mothers. Mm-hmm. So there, there's just this tremendous, tremendous need of, Who's gonna teach? Who's gonna teach this, right? So that's where this concept of Kala teacher was born, and actually, it was it's quite a modern concept. And that's, I think, if I from, from the research that I've done, a very very crush of a woman, Rabbi Sim Greenberg, who she's the one who who started this idea of Kala teaching, you know, as a one on one, you know, Kala with a you know, Kala teacher with a Kala to try to develop a relationship that it's not only going to be, you know, the, the certain amount of classes before the wedding and then goodbye and never see you again, but rather to develop a relationship. And I do feel that that set Kali Shal on a path. And I feel like from generation to generation, we've been getting better. Okay. I feel like there's, there's more and more clarity and, and, and willingness to, to reevaluate and understand that something different needs to be done for the girls today and for the girls of the future. So, so the gullus and the breakdown and the history of Kali I think that together created a situation where um, these topics are just not spoken about. And very often in the name of Tneas, mm-hmm. but it's very easy to confuse Tneas with shame. Right. And we can't do that. In Kali there is no, there's no, there's nothing to be shameful of, right? Shame is like, that's what I said about Christianity. That's a Christian idea of looking at these things as, as, as essentially negative or something that, you know, hush, hush, we don't talk about. And there's just like tension in the air around the topic that it shouldn't be like that. And it's very easy to blame that on sneers and modesty, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a time and place for everything. And that's the beauty of Yiddishkeit, the, 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 the balance, beautiful Yiddishkeit, that there is no other MS in the world. That is, that is MS. That is the way of life. And Torah teaches us that there's a time and place for everything. So there's a time and place 
for mothers to talk to their daughters and for fathers to talk to their sons and for these things to be learned in such a fundamental way without flushing and without feeling any shame, right? But when we've lost that, so it's very easy because I, mommy, am feeling uncomfortable to say in the name of Cleus that I can't talk to my daughter about these things. So I don't. And then she grows up and then she's searching for answers and where she meant to go. So that's really how um, this course came to be. That's how the work that I've done, you know, that's how it's come to be that these things have to be addressed. They have to be spoken about and more and more, uh, you know, Phil and Phil and Postkin are, are, are talking about these things much more open than ever because there is such a need in cholesterol, because this is, I feel where like the healing, you know, in preparation for Gula is gonna happen. It's gonna happen and I, and it's amazing because with everything going on with the coronavirus, it's like Hashem is saying, you know, go back home, close the doors. There's no shul to even go to right now and, and, and focus on building the Jewish home because that's where it's at. That is where Hashem rests his name. That's the only place where it says, Zahu Shrina Beneihem. The Shrina is between husband and wife when they are intimate with each other. And obviously, in a Jewish marriage, intimate with each other means that all the other levels of the relationship were taken care of. Okay? In, in Yiddishkeit, there is never, ever, ever such a thing as just physically being together. The physical is a mirror, it's a reflection of, of something much deeper. It has to be. If it's not, then that's not what Yiddishkeit is talking about. But that expression of oneness between husband and wife, when there is nothing in the way, nothing separating between them, and they become completely one, that, that's, the, like, that's like the oneness of HaKadosh Baruch that's the most one you could get in this world. And that is, um, that's, um, that's, that's, the, that's where the Shekhinah is. So, so these things are so important for Kali to heal in this area, and there's, there's, I mean, I see it happening for sure in Eretz Yisrael, and I'm sure it's happening abroad as well. There's like this like wave of, 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 of thirst, of desire to learn, and these topics suddenly are, are becoming more and more open, and, and if it used to be like back when I got married that there was very, very little where to turn for answers, I feel like today there's a lot, a lot more where to go, to, you know, a lot more where to turn to, a lot more is available. And there's a, uh, I think, a... Uh, a colossal recognition that, that that this is something that has to be given over like it used to be. Like wow. Be. Wow. That's like, that's pretty intense to say that, like, um, the Gaula will come, like, because of, like, this topic. But I hear what you're saying. Like, it's... I don't know. I, I don't know anything. I don't know. No, no, no. I know. No, it's written in the, in the, in the Gemara, in the, in the right. Midrash. It might have said that the women of the Shrayim, they were the ones that in there, it was close to the Gaula came. And where does it say that? By the by the by where the where it teaches us that they went out into the fields and the husbands who were so so exhausted they couldn't even come home the women would go out to them and they would awaken their hearts and awaken desire for their wife and then they would be together and then the women would become pregnant and those were the children of the gula so like that's what brought the gula and it says that the right. so that's that's us <laughs> that's us you right. know we, we have that power wow. Also, like, I remember learning this in seminary that, like, something that has potential for, like, greatness or, like, the most greatness also has the most potential for, like, tama, I guess. So, like, now, I'm not saying marital intimacy, but maybe just the way it's perceived. Like, there's so much, I don't know, negative perception, shame, like you're talking about, um, squeamishness, like, how do we talk about this with our kids? We know it's good, but we don't feel like it's good or we don't, we don't know how to present it or we don't want to talk about it publicly. Like we don't really know like the balance. So like you're, you're, you're confusing. confusing. Yeah. So, um, some like something that I just wanted to ask you, like, I remember when I was getting married, somebody said to me, um, like you really shouldn't talk about your husband at all to anyone except maybe like your mother or your mother-in-law. Um, and I remember her saying, like, even if it's neutral, because let's say, like, you say to your friend, like, oh, my husband, like, he's not, he's, he's such an easy eater, like, he's not picky at all. And your friend is, like, her biggest struggle is, like, everything she makes her husband doesn't like. And I was, and, and maybe I just take things a little too literally, but I remember, like, thinking about that a lot when I was first married, and, like, I kind of felt isolated, like, I couldn't really share, you know? Like, what would you say to that? So I okay. So let's 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 um let's take away the black and white and let's look at it. You know, okay. do I agree with that statement 100%? I say it to my own college. I do believe that a woman should not talk about her husband. Definitely nothing negative. That's Washington. Hall. We don't even say that, right? right? And definitely not positive or neutral because that can definitely cause a tremendous amount of jealousy. And I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it happen with some friends. Mm -hmm. 
Uh oh, Figgy, you're paused. Wait, don't give away your answer. Hold on. Am I paused? You know, the college should be taught this idea. Like, they should be open to, they should understand. Like, you know, you just, you can't just say, don't talk about your house. You have to explain why, why you have to be careful not to. But in the same breath, I say, but there are certain people who, of course, you should talk. You know, you should talk to if you need to talk. Okay, so first of all, if there's something really nice you want to share, of course, you could share your mother. She'll never be jealous. Share with your mother-in-law. You'll be the favorite daughter-in-law. You know, just thank her for raising your, your, you know, her son so well. But then if, and then I always say this, if you feel like you're this struggle or you're not sure if something is normal, then these are people you could reach out to. You could call me. You could call, you know, if, if I know that she's like in therapy and I know that she has a therapist. I would say this is something you think you feel, you know, you'll feel comfortable asking your therapist after you get married. Like you want to make sure that they have who to talk to after the wedding, okay? Now, even with saying that, I know that most colleagues are gonna talk about their husbands sometimes. I mean, I also fall into that trap sometimes and I just catch myself thinking so and have some legs, you know, I'm like, whoops, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think I do think it's good to know. I do think it's good. Enough. It's actually funny because I like read the book, The Surrendered Wife, and I know like we don't agree with everything she says, but it, it did really help me in my marriage. And um like I even did a chabura with two friends. Like we would read a chapter a week because we really wanted to like work on it and have like the it's ideas awesome. fresh in our head yeah and I remember her saying like if you really want to like complain to your husband or like nag him or like poke at something like just talk to your girlfriends about it which is like so not a Jewish concept but like I don't know it's a really hard balance because like what you know it's like the that like that book like the surrender rape isn't so like practical in that way because like sometimes you just like need to say something but like we know i mean at least i know from experience that like when you do criticize your husband like you just have more to fix later so like sometimes when you just talk to a friend about it and they like get it then it's over you know like you could bury it so it's hard it's a hard balance it's a very hard balance that's why i always say okay you have to connect with them but like talk to Hashem I'm just like okay. say Hashem please like really come on like didn't we like work through this already like okay. come on like really right. you know seriously um you could write all like regularly write a letter you know write a letter and don't send it mm -hmm. write a letter and send it <laughs> huh. write a letter that you'll see that it's good enough to be deal. and right. also okay don't feel mad your husband's in time that's right. all part right. of accepting the realness of life that we're not going to be perfect and we're going to nag our husbands in time but it's okay yeah. and we'll, we'll we'll ruin it and we'll have to fix just like we'll ruin it we'll have to fix right <laughs> so, so okay so talk to me about um your eft like as a practitioner how did that come to me okay so that's actually very very interesting i mean i feel like everything i do today is like from a place of like i was there i was in the dark I was blessed with light and I'm like, I can't keep this light for myself. I have to share it. So mm -hmm. it's amazing because I feel like I've really been blessed in my lifetime to, to be able to see the struggles that I had, to see the blessing in that. Like it's really, it's really, I'm so thankful every single day because those first years of my marriage were very, very difficult. And since I'll share my story, it's see, like going through a very rough period was very difficult. But today I look back and I'm like, had I not gone through that, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't have right. the marriage I have today. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the fulfillment I have today and I wouldn't be able to spread the light that I can spread today. So like, it's really a very, very big blessing. And I do believe that all our Nisionos are really that. You know, well, you should, should just know that I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing a blog post or a series. I haven't decided yet. And I've collected stories from people who have gone through something very painful and I've asked them to, in retrospect, reflect on it and see where they've gained and what, what changed them. So I'm going to quote you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I became a college teacher because I was like, well, I wish I would have done that. I dropped already. Right. So an EFT practitioner goes like this. After the birth of my fourth child, I came down with a severe, severe anxiety disorder, which took me a while to realize that I had an anxiety disorder. Like up until that point, I hadn't even ever, ever heard the word anxiety. Like I didn't even know what that meant. Although looking back as a kid, as a two-year-old, I probably had anxiety, but I just never, I just, that was normal. Like I just always felt like I'm just hyper vigilant and I have to like look out for like the next disaster. Mm -hmm. um, but then it all came just crashing down after the birth of my fourth. So it started out with panic attacks and I didn't even know at that point what panic attacks were. So the first time I had a panic attack, I literally thought, you know, thought like I thought I was dying. Wow. Heart racing and I just felt like I couldn't breathe. It was, it was so, so scary. It was so scary that I called an ambulance. 
I called an ambulance. I was like a month after birth and I called an ambulance. And, um, you know, they basically said, yeah, you're, you know, your blood work is fine. They sent me home. You have to rest a little, whatever. But then it kept on happening again and again. And then suddenly I realized that I'm living in the fear of the next panic attack. When is the next panic attack? Where is it going to happen? And the crazy thing is, is that even though it had happened so many times, I, like, at, at the, like, at the height of it, I was having, I could have had panic attacks, like, one an hour wow. during my, like, wow. like, when I was awake, you know, like, um, very, very, very intense. And I just remember, like, in my head thinking, like, I know I'm not dying. I know I'm not having a heart attack. I know I'm not going crazy. So why every time does it feel so real? And, like, I was in such a bad place, and I, I, um, I, I you know, I did blood work and everything. At first, I thought I had mono, you know, it was just. It was a very, very, very dark time in my life. It was very, very, very difficult. And um, at some point, I realized that, like, I really, really, really need help. Like, at that point, I was like, this is, this is just, this is not normal, and I, and I really need help. And I started going to a wonderful therapist who did PBT, which is the classic, you know, it's a classic. We prescribe babies today already not as much, but for sure back then, you know, CBT, like, oh, anxiety disorder, CBT. And... It was it was fascinating. It was my first it was my first um, exposure to therapy, and it was it opened up a world. It was amazing. It was very very interesting. But after many sessions and diligently doing my homework and and really investing myself in the process, I turned to my therapist and I said, "So when am I going to get better? Like when am I not going to have anxiety anymore?" And she said to me, "Well, an anxiety disorder as severe as yours usually doesn't just go away. You can take medication." And you're going to have to just like learn to manage, to manage your anxiety. That was the term, you know, manage your anxiety. And she was looking at her and thinking to her, you know, like, what? Manage my anxiety? Like, this is not going to go away. I'm never going to feel normal again. I just, I couldn't buy that. And I left that session. I, it just, it, it broke me. It mamish, like, I just felt crumbled. And I went to the coast. I'm very lucky to live in the United States. And just stood there and poured my heart out. And I said, Hashem, I'm young. I just had my fourth child. I have, you know, a marriage to keep together, a family to hold together. I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't live like this. I can't go on like this anymore. And the next day, the next day, my mother called me. It's very interesting because that's also part of the journey. It took me a long time to feel safe enough and courageous enough to be vulnerable to my parents and share with them what I was going through. So not only was I going through this very, very difficult time, but on the outside, no one would know. So I was holding it all together barely. And then finally, I was able to share with my parents. It was like a big, I think it was, was part of the process, part of the growth process. And then my mom, who at that point, she knew what was going on. She called me and she said, look, I heard about the therapy. It sounds weird. It's called BST. Why don't you give it a try? And she gave me someone's name. And I have to understand, like, there's the baby pollock before the anxiety disorder, and then there's the baby pollock after. And it's like two different people. Up until that point, I knew, like, nothing about being connected to myself I, I, there was like, it's like there was this whole inner world waiting to be discovered that I didn't know about. I knew nothing about how food affects us. I knew nothing about holistic health and healing. Nothing, nothing. I was just, you know, very run-of-the-mill conventional, <laughs> just doing what everyone else was doing, you know. And this EFT really did sound very weird, like tapping on yourself, like right. what in the world right. is that? Right. But at that point, I was so desperate. I said, you know what, I'm going to try anything. So I went for my first EFT session. And after one session, I felt this like lightness that I hadn't felt, I don't know, in, in years, maybe since I was like a child. And what came up in that session was with EFT, like a lot of imagery comes up that I was like carrying this, um, this like metal shield on me ever since I can remember myself. And like, it just at some point just got too heavy, you know, mm -hmm. and that was all the anxiety. And it was it was fascinating it was fascinating so i did a few sessions and i thought i was cured forever <laughs> that's it you know and i was like you see <laughs> my prayers were answered i don't have to manage my anxiety i feel great again and i really did great for a while and then as you know things came up in life whether it was in my marriage whether it was physical things like back pain or whatever that came up throughout life i always went back to doing the tapping and it always borrowed the shaman it always worked for me everyone has to find what works for them i don't think that there's one size fits all, there's different shapes. And then for me, it was a big shift. Yeah. Then there was a big change in our life. I, I lost my job, my husband lost the, the issue that he was learning in clothes. Like there was a lot of question marks. We didn't know where we were gonna go, where the was gonna come from. And we had to move, a lot going on. And I started getting panic attacks again. 
So this is when I knew like, okay, I'm going that for two or three sessions. Like I'm going to do this the real way. At that point, I know a lot more about therapy and about process and about growth. And I said, okay, I'm ready to like really come in. And that's when I started doing tapping on a very, very regular basis for like a long time. Even once I was feeling all the way better, I continued to do tapping. Like it was like my once a week, like my hour for myself, like just to go into me and 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 heal, you know? That was that was an amazing journey. And it was through that journey that I decided that I wanted to become the EFT practitioner myself. So after, I don't know, maybe two years, if I remember correctly, I was doing a lot of my own inner work. That's when I I did an EFT course, and then I went on and I did the training, blah, 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 and I did, you know, up until level three, and, um, and then at that point, I started working a little bit with clients, you know, you know kind of like experimenting on my friends, and still, you know, slowly starting to build up a practice, and then, it's hard, it's hard for me to, like, pinpoint when in time I actually started working only with institutions, but as time went on, I just kind of like gravitated more and more to working with women that are struggling with communication. So instead of just being an EFT practitioner and let's just come work on anything, even though EFT could work on anything, it really became very, very focused. And it, like I really narrowed it down. So like today, if someone will call me on that she has, I don't know, she has a phobia of public speaking, can I work with her with tapping? I would refer her to someone else who does either general EFT or specializes in public speaking phobias, right? Or phobias. Today, it's more, you know, the women who are attracted to the work that I do are more the women who are struggling with intimacy, and I integrate EFT, and I use that together with some other tools that I've learned to hopefully help them reach, reach that light, that light that everyone deserves. Wow, that's, that's a crazy story. Um, so my question to you about that is that, so I do intuitive eating, and um, I think that I recommend a lot of different modalities to my clients and they take a lot of time and they cost a lot of money. And I think that myself included, we hit like a wall, like maybe it's not until we're desperate. Like you said, like the EFT sounded weird, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of these, I don't know what it is. I don't know. There's a lot of these limiting beliefs. Like, I don't know if it's because, you know, EFT is not run of the mill. Um, even going to therapy, even admitting on the internet that you had some sort of panic attacks isn't, there, there's a lot of stigma around it. So, so for, you know, I mean, I hear your story and it's like, it's amazing, but it's also like, now that you're reflecting on it, it's like so obvious, like you needed some other type of therapy, but there are so many women, including myself that like, we just hit this block. Like I can't afford it. I don't have the time. It's too painful. So how do we, how do we overcome that? Well, we always have to dive in first. We just have to say, Hashem, help me. You, you gave me this. You, you put me in the situation. So right now I'm feeling so stuck and so like I'm hitting a brick wall. But Hashem, I know that behind that wall, there's so much light waiting for me. And Hashem, I need your help. I need your help. I think that's, I think that's the most important thing is to just really work. I mean, at the end of the day, that's why Hashem put us here. Mm -hmm. to give us the greatest thing in the world, which is a relationship with him, right? So that's why he gives us these, these walls and these pains because he, he, he wants us, he wants to give to us and he wants to give us himself a relationship with him. So to just really be able to, to, to dive in and ask for the Siyat and Nishmaya. And then, you know, this sounds cliche, but, but when we really, really need something, we're able to come up with the money for it. Always. Right. Okay. And if we can't come up with the money for it, either it means that we don't really believe that we need it, like we still have something in us that's resistant, or we really don't need it, meaning Hashem is saying, you think you need this, but you really don't, if you really can't afford this, then maybe you really don't need this, you need something else, and you can find something else that can help you. So it's a very, it's a very fine line, and I think the only one who can make a decision is a person himself, you know, for sure a wife with her husband, they could discuss together what she needs at this point in her life, but um, it's, it's often when we think, you know, oh, I feel like I really, really need something at the moment I can't afford it or I don't have the time for it. If we would dig a little deeper, we might discover that maybe we are still battling resistance to needing help. Mm -hmm. I hear that. Maybe there's something in us that's not showing, that's not whole with, I need help. Right. I'm human. It's right. okay. Wow. That's very powerful. Um, okay, so talk to me about 
like body image and women's issues with let's say food or any of that topic when it comes to marital intimacy is that a common theme that you see body image yeah body image related to marital intimacy yeah so i think that goes back to like what we were saying before about you know the 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 tuma and the princess, the, you know, everything, the promiscuity that we're unfortunately exposed to and all the negative beliefs that we acquire in society, there has to be a balance. Like Father Shparofu, because Hashem wants, like he said, he wants to give us the ultimate good of a relationship with him, but he wants it to come from us, that we chose it as ours. So there has to be free choice. So it has to be that it's not going to necessarily be the easiest choice in the world and that it's going to be confusing. So because marital intimacy is so powerful, and it holds the power to building the world, it can also be so destructive. So unfortunately, what we see in the world is the low side and the negative side. It's like almost like we see the, the, the shell without the fruit. We see the very, very external, low expression of what intimacy could, could be and could represent. And that I think goes along with our exposure to media and the Western world and the photoshopped, you know, picture perfect images that we've been brainwashed with since we, you know, walked out of our house for the first time as a newborn baby. I mean, my goodness, like, it, 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 it's in the air. You can't, you can't escape from it. And this definitely, definitely influences us because we're constantly measuring ourselves against a very, very false measuring stick, which will never quite match up to. So I think the first place to start is this recognition of that. There's so much talk today about, um, you know, loving yourself as you are, loving yourself as you are, loving yourself as you are. And then when we don't love ourselves as we are, because I don't know anyone who does, then we feel guilty. So not only do we not love ourselves, now we feel guilty because why don't I love myself as I am? So I feel like it's first important to say, like, of course we don't love ourselves as we are. How can we? You know, like, we're so bombarded with that, with that message all the time of an image that we'll never, ever match up to. So to just give ourselves a break and say, okay, like, it's okay, so I have to work, to work on, that's fine. Like, of course, I struggle with body image. Like, I think, you know, it's almost abnormal not to, <laughs> in, a, in a funny way. Like, of course, right. but of course we all struggle with that. But just to, like, to, to, to get rid of that extra, extra, extra guilt that we, don't, we really don't need to carry. And once we're able to give ourselves that break and to just say, okay, fine, so now it is what it is. So, okay, so this is something that I struggle with. How can I help myself? I think it helps very, very much to know, again, always back to Torah. Torah has all the answers. It says a beautiful thing, I don't remember where, that when a, when a husband and wife build a relationship the way they should, and their relationship has depth, and their relationship has meaning, and their relationship has chen, they have this like, this like charm in each other's eyes, and there's this mutual attraction. And when I say attraction, I don't mean attraction, like the world calls attraction, that there's always this like, sizzling hot desire going on in the background. That's not realistic. Maybe it's like that in the movies, I don't know. But but then there's this like feeling of like affinity and closeness and 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 and, and love and, and something sweet there all the time, or most of the time. Um, when that happens, so a woman becomes in her husband's eyes so beautiful and so beloved and so the one and only that all the other women in the world become in his eyes like, it's almost like comparing a human to a chicken, the carnivore, the carnivore. It's like, there's no, there's no comparison between a human being and a chicken, right? Now, of course, the Yitzhahara can, can make a person think a chicken is beautiful. But in a relationship where there's, where there's the foundation of love that should be in every Jewish marriage, then we are so much more protected then in a marriage, like a, like a Gaish marriage, it's not built on, on the foundation of Torah because, yes, it's true that men, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created men, they are more visually attractive. Right? It says in the Gemara that a man cannot marry a woman unless he sees her. He can't marry a woman unless he sees her because if he'll see something that's not pleasant in his eyes, that might come as a barrier in the oneness that's expected of him. Whereas a woman, there's no halacha, there's no way to demand that a woman has to see the man she's going to marry. Why? Because, well, even if a woman doesn't necessarily like the way her husband looks, I don't know, he put on some weight, she doesn't, she's not so attracted to his looks, 
for her in the nature in her nature as a woman that won't come as a barrier between her and her husband between the oneness that will happen between them because what matters for her is different her 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 nefesh is is yearning for for something different whereas for a man of course a man they both they both want wholeness with each other that's what they're that's what they're both after but for a man because hashem created it more visual there is that point that's more important to a man than to a woman so while it's true that men are more visually attractive and i think this is also a lot where body image issues come in because women are like well if he's a man and he's attractive visually then i have to be picture perfect mm -hmm. but at the same time the same man that hashem created to be visually attracted he also created him in a way that when he loves his wife and she loves and respects him back, she becomes the most beautiful woman in his eyes. So the same creator who created that brain to be visually attracted, created that brain in a way that it's mostly influenced by the way his wife treats him. So at the end of the day, he sees in her so much beauty. So it really doesn't matter. And now I can't say that this is true in all marriages, I don't know, but I've seen again and again, when women struggle with body image issues, and I ask them, whose struggle is this, yours or your husband? So not always, but very often the answer is my husband, he's happy with how I look. It's me, I'm not happy with how I look. Mm -hmm. I struggle with it, right? Now again, I'm not saying that this is true for everyone, and it could be that in different periods in a couple's life, different things will bother a husband, which is totally fine. A husband wants his wife to you know, keep healthy and fit and look beautiful, not a question, but, that picture perfect woman that we are measuring ourselves against because we think that we're going to only be attracted to our husband if we look like that that's a belief that i that i think should be challenged and we should be asking ourselves is that really true or are we kind of like um what's the word when we project um, project thank you are we projecting our own insecurity onto our husband and maybe really really we'll find the way we are. He just wants us to love him a little more and respect him a little more. And that's really all he needs. He doesn't need us to be two inches thinner, maybe. Okay. And even when at face value, it seems to be that, oh no, it's, oh, I'm, 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 I'm happy being fat. My husband wants me to be thin, right? Like it's coming from him. It could be that what that husband is missing in the relationship is something different. He just doesn't even know how to articulate it because he's also been influenced by society. And if we can teach this wife to be the kind of wife that that husband wants and needs and deserves, suddenly the two inches don't matter. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen before. Where what at first looked like a, uh, a body image issue or a image issue really was so much deeper. Okay? And, and that suddenly what mattered three months ago doesn't matter anymore now. And I, you know, I'll, I'll quickly share a cute, um, you know, an anecdote, a call of mine that I was teaching. So, when I, when I teach college, I try to explain, I try to explain the, the, the nature of a man, the nature of a woman, and just to like be able to respect the different natures and how we can work with them together to create harmony instead of to create gaps of And I said to her, you know, when a woman dresses up beautifully for her husband, she takes care of herself. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about um, looking perfect, but just that her husband sees that the way she carries herself matters. And, and she does that for him. It's clear to him that she's doing it for him, to honor and, and respect him. So what does he feel? Besides for, of course, more attractive, you know, she's more attractive in his eyes. But really, what's going on at a deeper level is she's more attractive to him because he feels respected. And I think this is also a lot what the book Surrendered Wife is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's the key to a husband's heart is respect. And when he feels respected by his woman, and that respect is expressed in different ways, and one of those ways is when a woman cares enough to put on something nice before he walks in the door. And she cares enough to put on some makeup when she knows that that's important to him. So not only is she more beautiful, but he feels more respected. And when he feels more respected by her, then she becomes more beautiful. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, you know, it's just like one thing influences the other. So I try to like impart this upon my colleagues and explain this to them. So Kala shared with me the following story. She was married a few weeks, Friday night, and you know, after taking her shower on Arab Shabbos, she put on her Shabbos robe and her tiffle and her glasses. And her husband said to her something like, oh, I thought you were going to like put on Shabbos clothes and your shako and some makeup. She's like, what? Friday night? Oh, who is going to Friday night? Like you wear a robe. And he's like, oh, I don't know. My, my mother and my sister 
put it on clothing. She's like, well, my mother and sister put on a robe and I'm putting on a robe, you know, that, that's it. And she could see that this, like, she was a little disappointed. And then suddenly she remembered our class. And she said, she said, you know, what am I going to get into this, like, silly place of, like, oh, I should love him the way I am. And who cares if I'm wearing a robe and I should be beautiful in his eyes, even in my robe. Okay, I'll get dressed. But she was, but, but she, she had a battle. She had a battle in her heart. She had a hard week at work, and she really didn't want to get dressed. So she said to me, "You know what? Let me let's make a deal. Tonight I'll stay in my robe, and tomorrow morning I'll put on, you know, your favorite outfit." So he's like, "Okay, fine. Whatever's good for you. I want you to be comfortable. I was just a little surprised." Anyway, he goes to show, and suddenly she's like, "I'm so I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm going to be dumb. Like, come on, I'm going to miss an opportunity. Go we'll get dressed." So she quickly goes. She gets dressed. And she puts on her shake doll and she looks, you know, beautiful. And she decides to go surprise her husband and goes to meet him. He's coming home from the show. He steps out of the show. And, you know, she's standing on the side there and he's like walking home. And she's like, you know, she waves to him. And suddenly he sees his wife all beautifully dressed up in her shake doll and her, you know, her heels and her outfit. And she said, his eyes lit up. You could like light up the street with the light that was shining from his eyes. You know, and they walk home and he's telling her how beautiful she was and how much she appreciates it, especially because, you know, how hard it was for her. Anyway, so I'm sure they had a beautiful Friday night. And then the next week he says to her, he's like, oh, by the way, I really don't care. You look so cute in your robe and tissel. Just, just keep on your robe and tissel, <laughs> you know? So she said to me, like, that was exactly the point that I was trying to make, that, like, when he saw that she was willing to go that extra mile and she respected his nature, she respected his desire, then it really didn't matter anymore, mm -hmm. you know? So that just kind of drives the point home. That at the end of the day, what makes us beautiful is working on ourselves as a human being, not working on the inches, you mm -hmm. know? On our, on our size of hips. Now, a woman should take care of herself. A woman should take care of herself for the simple reason that Hashem gave us a body. And our body is a gift. Our neshama is in that body. Our neshama can only do what it's meant to do in this world while it's in the body. So our body is such a gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we owe it to Him to take care of it, which means to shower and to rest and to eat well and to exercise and to, you know, to, to, to take care of ourselves to feel good. Not because we're trying to look like the model on the billboard, but because we want to be radiant human beings who radiate Selma Kim. And by doing that, we make Kiddush Hashem in the world. And by doing that, we, we create Shekhinah in our homes. By doing that, we feel good about ourselves. So that's why we should do it. Of course, we should take care of ourselves. It's not healthy to be overweight. It's not healthy to eat unhealthily. It's not right. So not because we need to be perfect, but because we should be healthy. And every person, to the best of their ability, some people, their nature is to be a little heavier. Some people, their nature is to be thinner. And they're all beautiful. There are so many types of beauty. A woman is beautiful. It says in the Gemara, Ain Isha El Eliyoki. A woman is, is beauty. She's, she's, she's the reflection of Shrina. She's beautiful. So there's different types of beauty. And every husband is attracted to his wife. And the more that they work on that relationship, and the more they enhance that one and that true intimacy between them, the more beautiful she becomes. So that's where the work should be. And the more we can remember that, I think the more... Um, confidence we'll have that even though we just had a baby and we're flabby and we gained weight and we have stretch marks and our hair is you know falling out or turning gray it doesn't matter because at the end of the day the only wife in the world that our husband has is us and there's no one in the world who could love him and respect him and cherish him the way we do and that's the most beautiful thing wow that's an interesting story i'm, th I'm going to think about it because it's funny because I mean, we're all a work in progress, but when, when you said it at first, like, I could feel, I could feel my, um, like, I can feel my resistance to it. Like, she's going to, like, even though I know it's so true, like, what you said, like, our job is to work on ourselves, and, and, and at the end of the day, um, they both kind of, like, got what they wanted, you know what I mean? Like, like, she she dressed up for him and therefore he felt respected and he also said like i want you to be comfortable and then she felt like he understood her need um it's interesting like i feel like it's sort of countercultural. like I, i'm not used to i'm not used to hearing a story like that and thinking like it's a positive one you know what i mean because my initial reaction is to be like Ugh, let me just be comfortable gosh you know but I hear what you're saying. Like there is a lot. There's a lot more to well, it. I'll reply to what you're saying. We could choose. We could choose to just be comfortable. Right. But there's a certain system that Hashem created. We could we either work with it or against it. So right. you know, it's like okay, we could just say forget it. She, she could have kept her robe on. Right. But what would she have lost? She was right. lost out on something so precious. And and I'm willing to bet that if she would have stayed in her robe, then that could have always been an issue in their marriage. 
And because she was so wise and she was willing to, you know, step up and say, okay, this is a need for my husband. And I can respect that even if I don't understand it. I can right. respect it. I can respect right. that that's how the world created him. Right. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why Hashem blessed me with the beauty that he's given me. And I can, and I can use that. Suddenly, it wasn't important to him anymore. It was like, okay, you could be in your own. Because again, because the, the mission was accomplished. He felt respect. Right. He felt taken care of. He felt like his wife was totally willing to be his wife. And that, that's what made her more beautiful. So that's why often at the beginning of the marriage, these things take up a lot more space. Whereas mm -hmm. down the line sometimes when the relationship is so solid already, the relationship is worked on correctly, these things aren't needed as much. Because that, that real, that true thing is there. But that's something that has to be built. Well, interesting. That's very interesting. Um, okay, so I learned a lot. <laughs> and um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, well, first of all, I love the idea of what you're doing. I really, yeah. you know, this idea of... of of, of, of sharing, first of all, the incredible growth that you've been through, and, and you're such a real person. You're such a you. such, such an authentic person, and people are drawn to that. You know, this this a beautiful cause that you have, and being able to you know have on board like-minded women, and, and thank you for giving me this, this opportunity to share you know a little bit of what I what I love to share is is really very very beautiful and inspiring, and um, it's actually interesting because you working with women struggling with with food. And their relationship with food. And I'm working with women struggling. I'm not going to even say struggling with their relationship with their husband. I'm going to say struggling with their relationship with intimacy and sexuality. Mm -hmm. Because that's where it starts. You know, what, what is my approach to sexuality and intimacy? That's going to influence my relationship with my husband, obviously, right? So I think that um, also with food, there's definitely an overlap. Um, I think this is also back to Bella's and lack of understanding of what Kedusha really means and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu created this world for. And we know in Yiddishkeit that everything physical, right, there is no such thing that something physical is essentially negative. It's all a matter of how we use it. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world, everything HaKadosh Baruch Hu created is, is, is perfect, is beautiful, is good. The question is, how do we use that? And food is one of those things, but how do we use food in our Godus Hashem? Is it a way to connect to Hashem or to distance ourselves from Hashem? And we've been, again, influenced by society with so many beliefs about food and our relationship with food. I think to a large extent, we've been robbed of our, and this is what I think what the eating is all about, um, that place where we could just trust ourselves to know what's good for us, what feels right for us and for our body and to be able to respect that. I think that's part of respecting the Tzal Melokim that we are. And um, there's this, when we come from an unhealthy place of relationship with food, and there's this like fear of indulgence and this fear of, of, of taiba and this fear of, you know, of, of you know, whatever, using food in a, in a way that might, you know, that might be negative. What often happens when you don't use something correctly and you try to, um, to go to one extreme, there'll always be the moments when we break and we go all the way to the other extreme. Right. Whereas if we're able to incorporate into our life eating as part of the Lord of Hashem, then every time we take a bite and we can try to be aware of that, then that, again, that helps us create that balance in our life. So, you know, a Jew who, who, who lives, you know, a Torah life knows that we never eat without ideally thinking first and making a bracha. So that already slows down. There's not this like ravenous, just, you know, eating like an animal. So we eat. Malachim don't eat. But HaKadosh Baruch wants us to be human. So we eat. The question is, how do we eat? And what do we eat for? And are we meant to enjoy our food? And this is a huge topic that we could probably make a whole podcast just out of the topic of pleasure. Right. You know, we think pleasure is not a Jewish word. Pleasure, I think, is the most Jewish word. Hashem created the world in order for us to have pleasure. And we think of pleasure as a dirty word. Pleasure is, is, is what the world was created for. So that we could fast in the, in the pleasure of, of, of Hashem's 
glory of Hashem's Shechina. And I heard a beautiful idea once. I don't remember if it was the altar from Slavad or the altar from Kel, but one of the Yudolim, you know, previous generation said, the world was created lehisani, for pleasure, comma, of the Shechina. You know, that, that the Oneg should be, um, you know, basking in the, in the pleasure and the glory of Hashem. And he said, in order for us to reach that high level of seeing the pleasure in our connection with Hashem, we first have to know what pleasure means. So that's why Hashem gave us in this world so many opportunities to experience pleasure. And that pleasure is nothing compared to the pleasure that we feel when we are connected to Hashem. But it's not two separate things. Spiritual pleasure and physical pleasure, we can't make a separation because we feel things in our body. That's where we feel things, our feelings and our emotions. We feel them through our body. It's not just something that we know in our head. So if we're gonna feel pleasure in our relationship with Hashem, us and hopefully teaching our children, we have to know what pleasure feels like. And the minute we start talking about pleasure, people start getting nervous. Oh, that's not a Jewish idea. We, we just have to eat just enough just to get by. Right. I don't know, it's true. That's a, that's a belief that should be challenged. Right. Hashem right. wants us to enjoy and wants to eat properly and eat well and eat in a way, again, indul we think that, you know, um, when a person just eats without, without, um, without their, I'm going to say without their intuition, okay, without being connected to themselves and they just eat and eat and eat and eat and there's no inner guidance telling them when to stop, that's not pleasure. That's called being stuck. That's called feeling not good afterwards, right? True pleasure is always something higher. The, 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 the more something is, is refined, the more that pleasure is real, right? So there's the pleasure of eating an ice cream. And if you know that if you eat too much of it, you're not going to feel good after. So it felt good for that minute. But it's not real pleasure because you suffered afterwards. Right. Whereas if you felt, you know, you felt when to stop and you stop, and then it felt good, that's real pleasure. But that's because there was a higher part of you involved in that decision. It wasn't just the animalistic face part taking over. So the higher we go, the more real the pleasure becomes. And I feel that when we work on our relationship with food and pleasure and, and understanding these concepts of owning and taiva and what, what's the place of all of this in Yiddishkeit, you know, you just copy paste it into your relationship. It's very much the same. And not surprisingly, Chazal often refers to the mitzvah of a husband and wife being together as eating bread. Achilas lechem. It's like eating. Because there's a lot of similarities. Just like the food, which is physical, connects our neshama to our body. If we didn't eat, we would die of hunger. And then our very, very beautiful spiritual neshama wouldn't be able to accomplish its task in this world. Because like we said at the beginning, we need a body. So the debit, the glue, that holds our neshama and our both together to a large extent is food. That's very physical. And the word ma'achal, which is food, if you change the letters around, is malach, which is angel, which is spiritual. Because when we eat with the right intention, we can turn that physical food into something very spiritual. And that's very, very much the avoda of a woman, the ability to do that. So very much in the same way, when a husband and wife are together physically, when their relationship is on a foundation of true oneness and true love. So the intimate relationship, which is physical, becomes like Devic. It's called Devic, it's blue. It, it, it so to speak, holds the, the, the neshama of their relationship together, the essence of their relationship together. And it connects them in ways that nothing else can. Wow. And that's why there's really a lot, a lot of similarities between our relationship with food and our relationship with sexuality. Interesting. It's actually interesting because my, like, like kind of like my tagline or like where I go, where I'm going with my brand is like intuitive eating is to help you heal your relationship with food to ultimately heal your relationship with yourself. And I'm not an EFT practitioner, but a lot of, I don't think any of the women who have counseled have heard of EFT, maybe a few of them. And um, I just, you know, introduce it to them. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a professional when it comes to EFT, but um, it's very deep. It's very deep rooted. And it, and body image and food are not the same exact thing, but there's a lot of these these limiting beliefs, like um, something that they've been told since they were a child. Like if you eat too much, like you um, you're not deserving of food, or like we're you know what I mean. Like if you are a certain size, like you're unworthy. 
and they're so much tied up in their worth in the way that they eat. And, and, and I like to, I really do like to take away the moral value when it comes to food, because even though, even though, yes, there is such a thing as like gluttony and overeating, most women who are overeating, they're not doing it because they're gluttonous. They're doing it because they don't have another coping mechanism. They, this is a coping mechanism maybe that they've learned or because they've been so limited because of dieting, they just feel so deprived, like you were saying before. So there's just, you know, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of layers, but um, that's yeah. kind of the work that we're doing. We're like tackling a layer at a time because yeah, there's a lot of, there is a lot of this negative feeling when it comes to pleasure or taiva or the confusion of the two. And, you know, I think women, women feel lost. They feel like food has like taken over their lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, I have learned a lot. So tapping, let's try to do this in like one, in like one or two sentences. Basically, I would say that the point of EFT, it stands for emotional freedom technique. And the technique that used that is used is slight tapping, light tapping, always on the same point, the head, the eyebrow, the side of the eye, under the eye, under the nose, the chin, the collarbone, some also do under the arm, and the side of the hand. And basically what we do is we focus on whatever, let's say, limiting belief we want to challenge or a fear that we're dealing with or whatever it might be, a certain thought that we want to work through. And we bring it up into our awareness and we focus on it. And as we focus on it, we do the tapping on these points. And what this tapping does is it quiets down the nervous system. It helps us access deeper parts of our of our consciousness instead of just being stuck in the like what we're aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. It helps us go deeper because mm -hmm. usually the things that are holding us back in life are the things that we're not so aware of at the moment. Mm -hmm. We're just barely aware of and they're deeper inside. And the tapping just calms everything down and slows down the brain waves and helps us access information that will help us, you know, gain some clarity as to why we're stuck with this issue, why there's resistance, where did I first acquire this negative belief, this limiting belief, and to just, like you said, layer by layer, work through these things to reach more and more and more clarity, wholeness, and healing. So I'll give a quick example. Um, let's say um, someone has. Um, you know, they crave chocolate and they've done a tremendous amount of work, but chocolate is always that one thing where everything they learned about intuitive eating just goes out the window. You know, it's like when it comes to chocolate, like that inner intuitive knowing just disappears. And then we might want to understand why is it like that? What is it about chocolate that's making her feel that way? And it's very interesting because I was working once with someone and I don't remember exactly the phrase she used, but she said something. I said, what does chocolate make you feel? And she closed her eyes, and the feelings that were coming up were this feeling of like, like loved and desired and cherished. And we were trying to understand, like, where did that happen? Where, where was that first born? You know, and just different memories from the past came up in her relationship with her father, her grandfather. You know, like the things that she got as a little girl or didn't get as a little girl. And just understanding how, when you stand in front of that piece of chocolate and you feel powerless, you feel very little. When you realize through the tapping that there's so much more going on, it makes so much sense. Then we could forgive ourselves, which is always the first step in healing. We can forgive ourselves, like, oh, it makes sense. Of course I lose all my power because this chocolate represents something so big for me. And by working through that and healing that, we can then have a healthy relationship. Then it's like, oh, chocolate is delicious. I just cleaned up the whole house. I deserve to celebrate. Yeah, I'm going to have a piece of two or three of chocolate. So I'm going to know when to stop because now I was able to heal something that was begging to be healed. And that was the gift of that chocolate craving. And that's something that we can uncover through doing the tapping through the gift because it's so, it's so simple. Right. It's actually like, it goes back to the beginning of the interview when we were talking about like you, your struggles with um, marriage and then becoming a college teacher, your struggles with um, the panic attacks and then becoming an EFT practitioner. It's true that, um, if we, if we take the time to unwrap, unravel, unpack this diet culture or this pain around a certain food, it kind of heals our whole life, which sounds like so dramatic to say, but it's true. We use, I, I always say this, but because food is, we have to eat anyways. And because like, maybe we're not going to go to drugs, go to alcohol, but we're, we are going to use food to mask some of our, of our feelings, which is totally normal. And I do try to normalize that. It's normal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but now, now that we, right, of course, I always say it's, it's, it's an okay tool sometimes, but it can't be your only tool. And, um, yeah. And this work is very deep. It's like, why do I keep, why do I keep going to the chocolate and not that chocolate's bad. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to put moral value on the chocolate, but for you, it's, it's blocking you. It's doing something to you. It's, and, and it might be like, I always say like, maybe it's your best friend. Maybe chocolate became your best friend because you didn't have anything else stable in your life. But now as an adult, you're not the victim anymore. Like, can we, can we learn what it's creating for you and move past it? Right. Exactly. So the chocolate is just an example, but that's just a right. little bit to demonstrate how, you know, how the EFT works and how it helps us get in touch with deeper layers of layers of ourselves so that we can heal. Yeah, and I will say that I took your course and I loved it. And we also had a session together where we did tapping and, I, and I've done tapping on myself, but doing it with someone else, it's, it's a world of a difference. It made a huge difference in my life and I highly recommend it if anyone's interested. Do you do Skype sessions with people like all around the world? So I, I did in the past before I gave birth. Now Baruch Hashem, I'm uh, enjoying my baby. So I'm trying to really work, you know, work a little bit less. And um, right now my main focus is trying to um, really push my online course forward because that's a way for me to get to a lot more people at once as, as opposed to limiting my time to working with one-on-one, -on -one, which is limited. My, my, my time and energy is limited. Whereas if I could hopefully get to more and more women and, and, and share my course with the world, that's where I feel that big, big change can hopefully happen. So definitely sometime, you know, down the future, I do accept women. Um, I do Skype sessions, but at the moment, I'm not, I'm not accepting the clients. But it is worth, um, like, like you said, even tapping on your own. It's not as powerful as tapping with someone else. And even though, Baruch Hashem, I have a lot of experience as an EFT practitioner, when I need to be tapping with myself, it's more effective when I go do it with a therapist my own therapist, right? Because there's only so much that we can um, that we can undo on our own. I think maybe if uh, we have to feel like we're in like a certain like safety net, or maybe some of the relationship between it's a good relationship between the practitioner and the client. But I call it band aid tapping. I say even if you're just going to do band aid tapping, like you're not taking care of the wound, but you're just putting on a band aid just to get through the day. It's an amazing, amazing technique. So even if you're feeling overwhelmed or you're standing in front of food and you're having a battle or whatever it might be, or you're feeling just about yourself and no matter what you do, you don't feel beautiful, like it helps to do a few rounds just to calm down a little bit. So yes, you might not necessarily be uncovering very, very deep issues, but it can definitely help to get through, you know, get through the next level, the next, the next few minutes. So it's definitely worth, um, even, even if you're not a DFT practitioner, I do think it's worth, teaching your clients how to do it. That's just the most basic level. Right. Have you ever heard of the thing, the thing called um, hollow sync? I, I've oh, just, what? it's called hollow sync. I'm, I'm very new to it, but I'm always like looking for more, you know, healing techniques. But okay. um, do you want to hear about it? Yes. Okay. It's basically this, um, this music, it's not really music, it's like noises that you listen to every day for an hour. It could be like while you're falling asleep or when you wake up, but it supposedly like clears away your subconscious. Like it helps, it helps like oh, wow. it's purpose. And like, just like when I was first introduced to EFT, I thought it was like really crazy. Just, I don't know where that limiting mm -hmm. comes from. I'm not sure maybe because I was like, went to school, I don't know, maybe from college, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's something that I'm trying. It's really interesting. I'm I'm very new to it, but wow. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, well, music is healing. Sounds are healing. We know that. I mean, the Levim and the Beit Hamikdash, right? They they right. play music. It it does something. It does something. So um, beautiful. Yeah, I'll let you know how it goes. I was, somebody, yeah, I recommended it. And I was like, I'm not doing that. And then I kept, <laughs> I go back to, you know, I also thought EFT was weird. I thought non-dominant writing was weird. I thought inner child work was weird, but it's really powerful. So we all have our blocks and it's worth yeah. it to try. Yeah, that's what we're here for. It's the work through, work through all of that. That's yeah. what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it unique. That's what makes us, you know, every single person, every single person is, is 
Kaviyachol, a certain expression of Elokut, of godliness, that only he is. There was no one ever like that before, and there never ever will be. And the more we heal, and the more we break away those layers and we shine, it's like we're allowing Elokut to shine through us. The more we heal, the more we shine. So, so this is the work that Hashem wants us to be doing, that healing, that healing work. And in the same breath, I'll say, but we also have to not give ourselves a break and know when to stop. You know, sometimes, right. Right. and I, I can relate, but I also, I, I, you know, since I, since I was exposed to EFT and learned about healing, it's like, well, I'm like I'm always thirsty right. and I'm always hungry, right? right? Sometimes it's important to know when to stop right. and to just step back and take a break and just be so proud of how far we've come. So important to do that. You know, mm-hmm. not to get too tied up because it can get heavy sometimes obviously right it's beautiful but it's heavy right there's a lot of intuition that plays into that like knowing yeah. when to push and when to stop yeah. yeah exactly that's why like you said when we heal our relationship with food it's it, you feel your life you really you really do. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to put your bio in the show notes and like all, any information that you want to share so that people can find you. Amazing. Thank you. This was an amazing opportunity. Keep up your good work. And um, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you.